comes tub, uh, comes size, or is that not included? So reference conditions is under what conditions do you know do you know the dose rate for your Linux? The TGP. Okay. Yeah. So in TG fifty one, you you measure the dose rate at what point? For what dose size? D max. A D max for ten by ten. And um, where's your point of interest? D max ten by ten. How far is your point of interest from your source? Uh, for photons, one hundred centimeters. Electrons, one hundred plus D max. Okay. So, but then that's a, that's called an SAD setup. Yeah. Okay. Because your your point of interest is one hundred centimeters, or your point of interest is at the ISO center. Okay. Some, but you guys need to know that some centers also calibrate an SSD center. Okay, so this is what this slide talk, talks about. Linux can be calibrated to deliver one centigrade per MU for a 10 by 10 field at the ISO center. And then, so this is what I mean by uh, reference conditions. This is it right here. One centigrade per MU for a 10 by 10 field at the point of interest using either of these two setups. So this is the SAD setup that we've talked about before, where 100 centimeters is from the source to the to the chamber. But there's also this setup, the SSD setup, where 100 centimeters is to the surface, but your chamber is a D-max step below that. Okay? And so it's one centigrade per MU here, or some centers will calibrate this way, and it'll be one centigrade per MU there. Obviously, they're different, right? Yeah. Okay, so which setup would require less MUs to treat a patient? So one center calibrates this way, a different center calibrates this way. Which one would take, which one would require less than use to treat a patient? Oh, there should be, there should only be one T at the end of patient, right? Uh, what's the setup for the patient? Both are SAD setups. Yeah, so when you, when they treat a patient, when you treat a patient, you're going to treat SAD. Well, I think the SSD should take more in. Should take um, more in you? Center A calibrates up SAD and center B calibrates SAD, SSD. I think SSD would require a lot of time to use the Why? Because your point of interest is farther away. Yeah, that's right. So your machine is actually outputting <coughs> your machine is actually outputting more. Um, think well think of it this way. Alright, so you've got one centigrade per MU here. Now let's convert this to it to this cell. Okay, and then let's measure the dose rate there. All right, so how do we convert this to this? We take our phantom, we just move it up. Yeah, that's it. Well, we might want to change our field size a little bit. Just a tiny bit. So we move it up. And then if we do that and we measure the dose rate there, what's it going to be? Is it going to be more or less? It's going to be more because we're closer. So if the dose rate is more here than here, then Remember the dose rate is in the, the one centigrade per mu is in the inherently in the denominator. Well, now it's going to be like 1.02 instead of 1. All right, so then that means that mu equals dose divided by 1.02 times something. So that, so that means the denominator is a higher number, which means that the mu's are going to be lower. Okay. So this setup requires, and this is the reason I put this slide is because when I first started working at Evanston, they had two Linux. One was SAD, and then one was SSD, and I had to you know, whenever we were treating patients and we had one patient move from one machine to another, I always had to make a mental, just a mental uh, reminder that those MUs are going to be, depending on which way they went, they're going to be different for the same for the same patient and the same treatment. So that was a little confusing. I'm glad we, we got away from that. Uh, okay, TPR. So this is a, a new dose function. T TPR is tissue phantom ratio, and it's, a, it's an SAD setup function. TPR is equal to the dose for a certain depth, for, an, for a certain depth for a certain field size divided by the dose for reference depth for the same field size. And that what's a field size? What could what's a typical field size here? What numbers are we looking at? 
So what is the range of field sizes we treat? 4 by 4 to 4 by 4, right? Typical. OK. Ranges of depth? Typical ranges of use. No radiation therapy. Huh? Probably 30 max. Yeah, 30 max. The shell is depth will be capped to, to about 30 cm, right? Typically. OK. Um, and, and usually, if this is the patient and we're treating with a beam, usually we're calculating to the center of the patient. And so this depth is rarely 30 centimeters okay, if we're doing a calc. Because then that would mean the patient's 60 centimeters. <laughs> That's a pretty big patient. Uh, so these depths are usually, you know, up to 20 cm for a new calcs. Okay, for a new calcs. Now you may want to calculate the dose to a point down here, just to know what it is. Okay, then that's that's where the 30 depth would come in, or the deeper depths would come in. Okay. Uh, all right. So DRF is the reference depth for dosimetry purposes. Most places use either Dmax or 5 cm. Okay, it's not always Dmax. The reference depth is not always Dmax. TPR is a generalized function that that allows you to pick a reference depth. Okay, for your center. So when TPR's reference depth is Dmax, then the TPR equals TMR. You folks have heard of TMR, right? Tissue maximum ratio. And that's what the M is, the maximum ratio. And it refers to Dmax. So TPR is equal to 1 at the reference depth for all field sizes. So if you open up your books and you look up a TPR, uh, you'll find that it will say 1.0 for all field sizes. And that's because you're normalizing it to that one field size. And you're taking the dose at a particular depth divided by the, uh, the dose at DREF for a particular field size. So all the TPRs will be normalized uh, for this uh, depth of DREF. So they'll be, they'll be equal to 1.0 uh, for DREF. Okay? Because if this becomes DREF, then it's 1. Uh, and the field size, the field size is 10. This will be, this will be D. D, D, ref of 10, D, D, ref of 10. And so that'd be 1. If this is a field size of 20, D, D, ref of 20, D, D, ref of 20, and they'll cancel and they'll be 1. Okay, so it's 1.0 for all field sizes. Um, TPR, well, if you said that, TPR is independent of SSD. Okay, so you can use TPR for different SSDs in different di distances away from the patient. And so what is the difference? between TPI and TMR, what are the pros and cons? Linux, I usually calibrate a 1 centigrade per meter Dmax, or 10 by 10, we know that. When calculating monitoring units with TMRs, you include a reference uh, dose rate of 1 centigrade in the denominator, right? 1 centigrade per meter, remember that? OK. So when calculating MUs with TPRs, you include reference dose rate at the reference depth in the denominator. So in your MU calculation, we're going to have dose divided by, and then there's one CGY per mu over here, times TMR, et cetera, et cetera. We'll talk about the rest today. So when you're using TMR, it's one. But when you're using TPR, in here, you don't use one centigrade per mu. You'll, you'll use the dose rate at your reference depth. Okay, so if your reference depth is five, this number here will be, it'll probably be a lower number than one centigrade per mu if your reference depth is five because they're because of attenuation. Okay. And then um, but then so if this is a lower number, would your MUs be bigger? Yeah. I don't know because uh, I mean say I have a TMR table and I have a TPR table. I can have two tables because I can convert them or measure them for one LINAC for the same LINAC. And I want to and I calculate monitor units and use my TMR table. And then I calculate monitor units and I use my TPR table. I should get the same MU because we're treating the patient with the same machine. So how did, how does that work out? Your TPR will be bigger. Correct. So these are not the same, that's why. So this will be lower and this will be bigger. Okay. All right, when calculating monitors with TPR, you have good references. So the advantages of TPR. Uh, here's the advantage. Dmax is the field size that 
is field size dependent. Remember when we talked about how field size affects the depth of the dose maximum? We know how energy affects it. But field size also affects it. As your field size gets bigger, what happens to the max? Gets shallower because of lower energy scatter, right, off the jaws. And, uh, and so that affects the, the depth of Vmax. So that's a problem, because if we're measuring TMRs, and we say, well, the, the Dmax for the machine is 1.5 for 6 MP. And we take our measurements, T, TMR is the um, dose at a certain depth divided by the dose of Dmax. But if the Dmax changes for the field size, we need to be changing our Dmaxes for the different field sizes. Okay, and, it, and then it becomes confusing. So that's a disadvantage of TMR, and with TPR, that's not an issue, because you pick you pick a reference depth of 5 cm, and you take your dose of depth divided by dose of 5 cm, and it's always 5 cm. Okay, so it, so 5 cm doesn't change your field size. 5 cm is 5 cm. So with TPR, you don't have that issue. I mean, it's not a huge problem, but it's a it's a small problem. Okay. Uh, and then the low energy scatter effects are reduced at 5 cm because at 5 cm it attenuates. All the, the low energy uh, photon and electron are, are attenuated at 5 cm. So in my opinion, I think TPR is nicer. It's nicer. It's cleaner. You get rid of the low energy, the low energy effect, and um, um, and but TMR is a little more. It's a little more. It's, it's traditional. Uh, it's. Um, and also, the advantage, the main advantage of TMR is that this is one. This number is one centigrade prime mu. So if you forget, you can forget to put the dose rate when you're doing TPR. If you have TPR tables, you may forget to put the dose rate in your new calc. Okay. So with TMR, if you forget it, it's not a big deal because it's one. Okay. So that's the advantage of TMR. I think most people still use TMR. Uh, every place I've worked at, it, it's always been TMR. Okay, measuring. So how do we measure a TMR? Uh, SAD setup. So start taking readings with 10 by 10 field at Dmax, Dmax depth, then take the readings at several field sizes. Repeat for another depth in the same and the same field size. So first you take a reading, here's your water tank, take a reading with a chamber there with Dmax over it. Make sure you're at 100 cm. Then add some water, take another reading. So we're not moving the chamber now, we're just adding water. So we're changing the depth. And the field size stays the same. And then add more water, take another reading. Okay, and then, so we do that for one field size, and then we change the field size, we do it again, we change the field size, do it again, and we build a TMR table. That's how you measure TMR. Okay, field size dependent scatter functions. So, um, so th this is another one, S of CP is another function you folks have to know about. And S of CP uh, does not depend on, let's see, I shouldn't say it doesn't depend on, on depth. S of CP, the main variable in S of CP is field size. And people call this an output factor, field size factor. Okay, and S of, the S in S of CP stands for scatter. And the C stands for collimator. And P stands for phantom. So there's two kinds of scatter in this function. There's a collimator scatter and a phantom scatter. And you'll you'll realize in a second why this is also necessary. So the TMR is not is not enough to calculate monitor units. You'll also need this factor as well. So S of CP is a photon output factor, also called uh, t some people also call it TSCF, total scatter correction factor. Okay, and it and it accounts for all it accounts for the field size effect of scatter uh, to your point of interest. So it contains information about scatter coming from the collimator jaw faces, as well as scatter produced in the phantom of the patient. And but it can also be defined at field sizes other than Dmax. So I have Dmax here because that's the most common definition of S of CP. Okay, so let's read this out. So S of CP is equal to the dose for a particular field size of Dmax divided by the dose for 10 by 10, which is usually the reference field size at Dmax. Okay, and it's how do you measure SOCP? So this is, by the way, these measurements that I'm talking about, you guys might be asking, do we measure them every day or once a month? Or, we actually we take these measurements when we commission, originally commission the machine. And then, then we do spot checks on a yearly, on an annual basis. We do spot checks of these measurements. 
So measuring SA, measuring uh, S of CP, use an SAD setup. So 100 centimeters from your chamber to the source. The chamber is placed at a depth of D max. This is water for 10 by 10. And then you change the field size, you take another measurement. Change the field size, take another measurement. And then you divide all your, all your measurements by the 10 by 10. Okay, and then there's, uh, and then you take S of CP values for 6 MV, 10 MV, and 18, whatever your, whatever your linear energies are. Okay, so why do we need S of CP? Don't we take scatter into account with TMR? So in other words, if we just, if we say mu equals the daily dose, say it's 180 a day, we have one CGY for mu times TMR, isn't this enough? Here, we have a depth dependence and a, and a field size dependence. Isn't that enough to calculate? Because this TMR, as the field size gets bigger, TMR is going to get bigger because there's more scatter. As the depth gets deeper, TMR is going to get lower because it gets attenuated more. So shouldn't that take care of everything, all the effects that are going on? But not really. And the, not really because, remember TMR is 1.0 for all field sizes at Dmax. Yeah. Okay, so we know that the dose rate is going to change as you change field size because there's yeah. more scatter. Okay, so, so the 1.0 is not enough. And that's where this comes in. This is where S of CP comes in. So we need to multiply by S of CP. By the way, this is all in the denominator. We multiply by S of CP, and that's the field size dependent factor. Okay, remember TMR is always divided by is I was normalized normalized to whatever field size you're taking your measurements. So it doesn't account for differences in dose rate at D max. Okay. So this is where S of CP uh, comes in. Okay, so this is what S of CP looks like on a graph. So this is this is probably measured data that I took from some machine. And uh, here's S of CP just to you give you guys a, an idea of the values, the range of values. So S of CP goes from, or this is for 6x, uh, SSD is 98.4 and depth is 1.6. So it goes from about 0.94 to, what does this look like? Maybe 1.08 or one, about 1.1. And so there's a range of, that's, that's 10 per, from here to here is 10% plus another four. There's a range of around 14%. Okay, so when you're when you're looking up an SFCP, and you, if you look up the wrong number, you can be off by 14%. Okay, so make sure you pick the right the right field size and the right SFCP. And this is just this red line is just a a fit of SFCP. Oh, and then down here. The smallest field size for SFCP in this curve is a, is a 4 by 4 field size. As you get lower down here, and it doesn't say what chamber we use here, but as you get to smaller field sizes, you need a smaller chamber or a diode. And I'm going to try to give you guys electron uh, small field dosimetry. But I'll introduce it here uh, a little bit. So we need a smaller, down here for these field sizes, we need a smaller uh, detector, number one, because if you're using a farmer chamber, you know the PTW farmer chamber that we talked about. That, I mean, the length of the chamber is pretty long. I believe it's um, it's about it's about two cm in length or something. Okay, so if your field size is smaller than two cm, you're going to cut off the chamber. Okay, and we know also that for charged particle equilibrium, we need scatter around the chamber. Okay, so we need a little bit of margin around the chamber. So that limits that limits the minimum field size that we can measure with that chamber. Okay. So we can use a smaller chamber as well. So we can use a smaller chamber, and that'll help us get down to maybe two by two. But here, here's some here's some data that a group. Okay, there's a the reference up there that a group measured. They they used a lot of chambers, and they measured output factors for different chambers to look at the response of the of the uh, of the chamber to to varying field size. This is for six MV and it measured on the central axis. And look at this. Look at this circle right here. This circle is the circle data points. This PTW is 0.6 cc. That's the one I was just talking about. So look at what happens 
for field sizes that are I'm gonna draw that straight. Anything anything above a three, let's look at it's important to look at the scale too. Here's a, here's a ten percent difference between here and here. So these are about ten percent differences here. So this looks like it might be for a field size of three, what does that look like? It's still a little lower. But it's well within 10% difference. Maybe it might even be well, with, well within 5% difference. The difference between the PTW and all the other chambers, okay, for a three by three. But as you start, as you start dropping now, these start spreading out. So the PTW definitely huge difference between the PTW and the other chambers. The other chambers, let's take a look at what they are. This is a this triangle one is a 0.3 cc, so it's a chamber that's half the volume of the 0.6 cc. And then what else is in there? Um, so this this is a scantronic single field, sorry, uh, stereotactic field diode. It's a, it's a diode. It's a very small collecting area. This one, I'm not sure what this one is. PFD. Extradin A16 is a microchamber. That volume is point. Was it point oh oh? I think it's point oh oh seven cc's. Very small chamber. A PTW pinpoint, that's probably comparable to the A16. This 0.125, that's a scanning chamber. Remember the change we use when you scan? That's what that is, 0.125 cc. Uh, 0.3 cc, we're talking about 0.2. PTW Marcus, that's the plane parallel chamber. It's pretty small too. And IC4, I'm not familiar with that chamber. But anyway, those, the, these two are the biggest chambers. And those are the ones that are showing the largest difference between their readings and, and the other the other regions. Okay. So, and the reason that this drops off so quickly is because if this is, if we look at our field size, and that's a, a beam size view of the field size and the chambers in the center. As the as the field gets smaller and smaller, we start to lose uh, we start to lose scatter into the chamber. And as it gets very small, uh, that scatter component drops extremely quickly. Okay, because then the air in the chamber becomes comparable to the, to the field size, and there's no scattering air, right? So, so that's one thing. The other thing too is, as you get really small, there's another effect. Here's, uh, let's see how they're hanging this. There's another effect that occurs. Here's the source of radiation. I'm exaggerating. Okay, it's usually two millimeters, typically, the size. Of the, of the target where the electron beam hits the target, that source is typically, people say it's two millimeters in, in size. So, and then your jaws are down here. So if your chamber is, if your chamber is here and your field size starts to get really small, like we're talking about like less than a centimeter in, in size, you're, you're going to start to obscure the source, which, which means if you're obscuring the source, uh, really at very small uh, field sizes, this is two millimeters up in the head, but remember it diverges, so it gets the divergence is larger. You start to um, you start to cut off with your jaws. Here's a jaw, and here's a jaw. You start to cut off uh, the amount of, and then this is so all the photons emanate from the source isotropically. You start to lose some of the photons. Okay, so your beam intensity. Is smaller. I see it's a really small field size. It's because you're obscuring the actual source with your jaws for really small field sizes. So those two effects is lack of scatter and then obscuring uh, the radiation source. Those two effects contribute to this very quick, a very quick drop in readings. Okay. So moral of the story is for really small field sizes, they went down to actually they only they went down to one by one. I mean I use it for stereotactic field sizes I come down to here. So down here, these will also spread apart as well. I have one seat at uh, half cm. So they'll spread out even more. Uh, so at those very small stereotactic, um, stereotactic uh, size field sizes, then you're pretty much limited to, to things like um, diodes, where the collecting volume is really small. Okay. So let's split up the two kinds of scatter. Remember S of C P, the C stands for collimator, P stands for phantom. So let's put up, split up those two effects. Okay, the animation stopped. Okay. Alright, so the first effect is collimator scatter. So 
uh, for, uh, for measuring S of CP, they scatter off the collimator faces, and as the collimators, as the field size gets bigger, the area of the collimator faces is larger as well, so there's more scattering. And so that that's part of the part of the um, the reason that S sub CP gets larger as you open up the collimator. The other effect is as you open up the collimator, uh, you're also exposing more area inside the patient for scatter. Okay, so. But as you, if you open it to this field size, your available volume, I should say volume, because scatter comes from all, all, uh, all dimensions. As you open this up, if I open up the jaws to this point, all this, all this extra volume here is available to scatter into the chamber. Okay, so as I open up the jaws, there's scatter coming off the faces and there's scatter coming off the patient. Those are the two components. So if we separate them, collimator scatter, S sub CP is actually a product of two components. It's a product of S sub C and S sub P. So S sub C times S sub P equals S sub CP. Collimator scatter, S sub C, increases with field size due to more job face available for scatter, but increasing the field also reduces chamber back scatter, which lengthens the beam on time, which increases S sub C for larger fields. All right, so let's talk about what this, what this means. So as you open up the field size, we get more scatter off the collimator faces, but look at what happens. This, the uh, there's some back scatter that's that's occurring off the jaw face, off the top of the jaw, into the monitor unit chamber. Remember what the purpose of the monitor unit chamber is. I gotta stop talking for a second. <laughs> I, haven't, I haven't given you guys a chance to, to ask questions. You, okay, what's the purpose of the monitor unit chamber? Make sure that you're giving as many monitoring units. Oh, and how does it work? Just in general, how does it work? Measures the incoming output. Okay. Measures the threshold. Okay, measures it. How does it measure? It's a chamber, right? It's an ionization chamber. It measures, it measures ions, and, and after a certain amount of charge collected, it'll shut off the peak. Okay, and we know that there's two of them, right? There's a redundant one back there as a backup. Okay, so what happens if uh, if the radiation that's coming through it, uh, if there's there's radiation that's coming from another source, what would happen to the beam? Along with the radiation that's going right through it, that's going to have to have <coughs> the there's another source of radiation that's measuring. What would happen to the beam? The beam would shut off. It would shut off quicker. Okay, and that's exactly what happens uh, inherently. That's always happening. Because there's scatter inside the head, and there's scatter that that, that uh, interferes with the uh, with what the ion chamber is reading. But what if that scatter is variable? I mean, if it's always constant, it's not a problem. But because the jaws move in and they move back and forth and in and out, that now makes it variable. Okay. So sometimes it's going to shut off sooner. Sometimes it's going to shut off longer. Later. And so, but we know this. But we know this in fact, and we can take this into account. So, if the jaw faces are closed, do you think this backscatter effect, do you think there's going to be more radiation or less radiation going back into the chamber? If they're, if they're closed. More. Okay, so, all right, so if the field size is smaller, there's going to be more backscatter going into the ion chamber. Okay, so if the field size is smaller, that's going to shut off the beam quicker. Okay. Uh, but we know that S sub C, as the field size is smaller, S sub C is going to be smaller also. Okay. So uh, that actually, um, so if we write out the MU equation, MU equals the dose. Now S sub C is going to be down here somewhere. So for a small field size, S sub C is small, MU is going to be big, right? So MUs are going to be big. But if, if the field size is small, there's scatter going back into the ion chamber and it's going to shut off the beam sooner. So those two effects kind of fight against each other. Okay. And those two effects, by the way, are inherent in our measurement. When we're measuring this, it's all built in. Okay. But there's a problem. The problem is that there isn't two jaws. How many jaws are there? There's four jaws. Okay. So these are the upper jaws. And these are the lower jaws. The lower, we're going to assume that the lower jaws are moving in and out of the board. 
We got which ones are the lower jaws, X or Y? X. Or the very machine it's X, okay. I don't know. With the left hand not know. But anyway, so these are the X jaws and Y are the upper jaws. So are these jaws is the field size of these jaws gonna affect that? The back scanner? No. They're too far away. So they're really not gonna affect that. So it's really just the the effect of the of the Y jaws that are gonna affect the monitor unit chamber. Now, okay, all right, let's think about this. Is the ion chamber? Yeah, so so that means that if you measure a, if you measure the dose for a fuel size that looks like this, and this is X and this is sorry, this is Y. Oops. Y and this is X. Okay, you're going to measure for 100 monitors, say 100 monitors, and you put a chamber in the center of the field. You're going to measure a certain charge collected, and then you, for the same field size, you close Y down. Sorry, you close you close X down, and you open Y. You're going to get a different charge collected because of, because of the back scattering. It's the chamber is different. Okay. So if we look at this and we say, well, why are the upper jaws? And why is they're pretty short, they're small. Uh, they're small. So we're going to get uh, a lower reading here because there's more backscatter into the chamber than we will get here. All right? So um, it's not enough to just measure S of C. It's not really enough to measure and to get accurate monitor units because of this effect. Because you're going to get a different charge collected here than here, and this effect is about two percent okay, over the, over the whole range. So it's not enough. So what some certain treatment planning computers do, like Eclipse, they have you measure all the rectangles for all the field sizes, which is it takes about four hours to do. So we measure S of C feet for Eclipse for field sizes that go from four by four to forty by forty, and we do four by two, four by six, four by eight, four by twelve. We go all the way to four. Then we go, then we do six by four, six by six, six by eight, six by twelve. And then we go to eight. <laughs> and we do, you know, so all the combinations. So that takes forever, but we we get this effect. And so it's all built into the effect. Okay. Okay, so that was that. I just discussed that. Does all that make sense? What I said? Okay. So I discussed that point. And then phantom scatter, SFP, increases the field size due to an increase in patient scatter. So this only has to do with what's happening inside the patient. Uh, need to have SFC and SFP separated so that we can calculate scatter accurately when using custom collimators like MLCs or server blocks. These beam blocking devices will affect SFP, but because phantom scatter will be reduced, but not affect SFC. Okay. S sub C is only affected by the position of the jaws. X1, Y1, X2, Y2. That's it. Okay. But S sub P is affected and depends on your MLC shape. And it also depends on your jaws. Okay. So let's so that's why we need to separate them. Because if we just had S sub C P and we said, well, we have a we have a field size that's um, if we just had a sub CP and we had a field size that's defined by this, say this is a beam's eye view, and that's our field size. But if we changed, if we changed the jaws, if we changed the jaws, it would affect how much backscatter is going into into the chamber. But it might not affect, uh, it might not affect the dose right here too much. Uh, so wait, 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 let me make this clear. Uh, we, if we if we just had a sub CP and we say well. For S of CP, we need to find an equivalent square of this shape, whatever it is. And it was, say it was 14 by 14, equivalent square for this block field. And then we, um, well, this, maybe this isn't a good example. Let's just say the block comes all the way here like this, and this is blocked. And the jaws, the jaws are not contributing to the shape of the field. Okay? The field is just defined by MLC. So if we move our jaws, the amount of scatter in there is not going to change. But it is going to change. How much is being backscattered into the chamber? So we have to have a we have to have a two functions. We have to have a function that can, that depends on the jaw position, and then we have to have another function that depends on the phantom position, uh, phantom scatter. So 
Again, S sub C depends on field size. A, capital A, is the field size defined by the jaws. Okay. And then little a is the field size defined by the actual field that's hitting the patient, the aperture, field aperture. Okay, defined by the block, by separate blocks, or by MLCs. Okay, so we have two field sizes now. And it's important to know that S sub C depends on A, and S sub P depends on little a. Okay, so you need to make sure you get those straight. Um, a, a is equal to collimator setting, usually given as the equivalent square of a rectangular field. And little a is the field size of the block field, usually given as the block equivalent square. And we'll, we'll uh, talk about block equivalent squares in a second. Okay, so there's an equivalent square that's just jaws, and there's another equivalent square that's a block equivalent square. All right, so how do we measure S sub C? Again, we measure S sub C when we first commission the beam. We tend not to go back to S sub C, actually. So we place a chamber in air with build-up cap, and we vary the field size. We normalize all our readings. So this is a lot like the S sub C P that I talked about. Normalize all the readings to 10 by 10. The problem with this measurement is that the build-up cap will get too large for higher energies. Also, too many contamination of electrons are collected. The same issue that, that I talked about in the first slide, when I said that TAR is a problem because we're measuring in air, that happens with S sub C. And why do we measure S sub C in air? Because it doesn't turn on the material that you're radiating. Yeah, because we want to separate we want to separate collimator scatter from phantom scatter. So if we measure it in phantom, we have phantom scatter. We want to separate them. So that's why we measure it in air. Okay. But then we run into this problem again with the chamber and the build-up cap and we can't get down to a down to a small amount of field size. So what people have been doing for several years now is they, they've they been using this this thing called an ESTRO mini phantom. And ESTRO just stands for European Society of Therapeutic Radiation Oncology. Uh, ESTRO mini phantom, uh, there's the reference. And the mini phantom is built, it's a cylinder with a hole inside of it drilled lengthwise. And you put the chamber in there, and the chamber then goes to an ammeter. And you set this up at the central axis of the beam. So the central axis of the beam would end up at the sensitive volume of the chamber. And this is typically 10 cm. And this uh, depth is 10 cm. And this cylinder is made of solid water. It's a cylinder made of solid water. And then you place this point at the central axis of the beam in air. And then you take readings with your ammeter, and you take Coulomb readings with the ammeter, and again, you take uh, readings for different field sizes, and then you normalize all your readings to the 10 by 10 field size. And that's S sub C. And the reason they, they do it like this is because they ensure, they ensure enough buildup, and so the chamber has enough uh, uh, buildup for charged particle equilibrium. Um, also, uh, the other advantage is that you don't have a stem effect because if the chamber is on its side, remember this, if the chamber is being, if the chamber is in this direction, and you vary the field size, you could have stem effect as the field size uh, radiates. This, is, this doesn't really look like a chamber, but anyway, this is the, the stem and this is the cable. You're minimizing stem effect by pointing it straight up, because you're always irradiating the whole chamber. Okay, and then they've also found that this model is S sub C um, as, as accurately as possible using this mini phantom. So I mean you can you can also use a diode to measure it to measure S of C. And the diode has a infinitesimally small volume that it's collecting over. And so they've compared diode measurements to this kind of measurement with the chamber and they compare very closely. So this is this is pretty much the standard way of measuring S of C now. Another thing that people do is they'll take a chamber and they'll instead of putting a plastic build up cap, they'll put a build up cap around it made of copper. Okay, it's a high Z material, so the D max is a lot thinner than it would be for a solid water or for plastic. So they do that. But there's a lot of there's a lot of other things going on in copper. There's a low energy electrons that get created. And so the SFC is not as accurate when you're doing it this way. So here are the scatter functions all together. 
S sub CP uh, is the lowest for field sizes less than 10 by 10, and then it becomes higher if field size is greater than 10 by 10. S sub C is the lowest value for field sizes larger than 10 by 10, and then S sub P is kind of like And then let's take a break. It's 10 30 already. How many slides do I have today? Somebody tell me. Um, I think it says 23 right there. 23. Oh, 28. Yeah, 28. Oh, there you are. For the speakers and cosmetic damages. All right, back from break. Let's keep going. <laughs> oh, bless you. Thank you. So, dose-rated patient. So, we were, we uh, we talked about TMR and S of C and S of P, and then um, and then S of CP, right? S of CP is the product of the two. Now, let's calculate. Now, let's see how we're going to use it. Bless you. So, dose in the patient depends on field size A and block field size little a and depth. Okay. And then so the dose rate inside of the patient is equal to S of C. Again, big A is the equivalent square of a collimated field with just the jaws. And S of P depends on a little a, which is the blocked field, which is the, um, the uh, aperture that uh, the patient experiences, the, the radiation that feels as the patient experiences. Then, then TMR. Now, here's something else to remember. TMR depends on, we all know that TMR depends on field size. But is it big A or little? It's little A. TMR depends on the scatter in the patient. It doesn't depend on the, the jaws. It would depend on the jaws if there's no normal C. Okay. So again, going back to this, going back to this picture. Going back to this picture, this I'm looking at this representation here blocks. This also could be MLC. TMR depends on the blocked field. Not the common okay, because TMR depends on the scattering of the patient. Okay. So that's important because when you're doing that new calx, you need to make sure you look up the right field size. So remember that. And then the one centigrade parameter reference dose rate. So an SAD setup for a given field dose, field dose, and this is typically for uh, for for certain fields. The MUs are calculated for, obviously, for each field. And the field dose is typically, if it's at a 180 centigrade a day, the field dose for a single field would be 180. For two fields, it would be a percentage of the weight of each field. So MU is, MU is equal to S of C times S of P times TMR times the reference dose rate. In an SSD setup, replace the TMR with the PDD over 100. Okay? If there are no blocks or MLC, we can replace these individual factors by S of CP of the equivalent square. Okay. So, no blocks. If there are no blocks or no MLC, we can do this, and it simplifies things. Okay. And this is the equivalent square. This depends on equivalent square. Okay. If there are blocks, we need to separate them. And S of C depends on little a. And S of P, sorry, did I say that? I said that wrong. S of C depends on big A, which is the blocked equivalent square from the jaws. And S of P depends on the little a, which is the blocked equivalent, the blocked equivalent square from the big A. And then the, these are just some tables of S of C's and S of P's. And I put them in here because uh, we're going to use them for some examples. Okay, so now let's take a look at these. And let's see how different they are between the energies. So let's look at S of P first of all, for a small field size, going across 0 0.96, 0 0.963, 0 0.955, within 1%, right, for a small field size. Let's go down to uh, 20 by 20. 0 0.26, 0 0.023, 0 0.027. Interesting. We're all, we're all really similar. Okay, so S, what about S of C? Small field size, 956, 942, 949, again, within a percent. 
20 by 20, I said C, 025, 03, 02. Look at that. They're almost the same. Okay. So this tells us that the field size dependence does not really change that much over the energies. Okay. But going from here to here, there is a big difference. Okay. There's a, over a 20% difference between here and here. Uh, 2%. 2%? Well, it's 4 plus 2. 4 plus 2. Yeah. About 8% difference. Okay. And this one, same thing between here and here. So this means that if you, if somehow you catch an error and you say, whoa, look, somebody calculated this, these MU calcs and they use the wrong energy to calculate SMP or SMC or SMCD, it's not that big a deal. Okay. So you know how sometimes, well, I'll tell you guys, when I, when I find an error, right away I do a, a damage assessment to, to figure out how serious this error is. Okay. So if I would have found an error where somebody picked the wrong table, I would have thought, okay, it's just the, it's just the wrong, uh, wrong energy. But I know that the scatter factor is very little among between the energies. But if they pick a field size of, this is 20, I don't even have 40 in here. Okay. So this keeps going up, this keeps increasing. So if they pick the wrong field size, then the error could be more significant. Okay, and then also, uh, at the beginning of the lecture, I talked about how to measure TMR. And in fact, I've, I've done that many times, but I don't do every field size because it's a, an enormous amount of measurements. Because for each step, I have to change, I have to change the water depth. Okay? So what, what I do, and what most people do, is they measure PDD, and they convert to TMR to get a full TMR. It's a lot easier to measure PDD because you're just, you're moving, the chamber's moving continually, and you're getting all these depths just by one scan. How long does a scan take? Remember? A minute? Two minutes? Okay. For a TMR, to change the water, depending on how you're changing the water, it could take hours to scan one to scan one field size. Because you might have to you might have to go in there and have some kind of graduated cylinder where you pour a certain amount of water and then look at it and go out, take your measurement, and come back in. Or you could have an automated water tank. There are some automated water tanks where there's a tank, here's the surface of the water, and there's a pump that feeds the water. Okay, and then there's this little rod. This is one system. There's different ways of doing this. There's a rod with a floaty thing, a little floater. And this floater rides on this rod, and based on the uh, current that this this is a magnetic floaty thing. I don't know what the what the call it thing. But anyway, based on where that is along the rod, it knows the height of the water. So as this pump is filling, this pump, this uh, this floater is inducing a current on this rod, which is talking to the computer and telling the computer what depth you're at. So if you have this kind of system, and by the way, the chamber's in here at central axis, right? And so if you have this kind of system, you can measure TMR probably as fast as you can measure PDD. Well, no, maybe not as fast because you've got to wait for the water to fill. Okay, but most people don't have it. So it's okay to calculate the TMR from the PDD, it's pretty accurate. <coughs> and this is how you do it. And the derivation of this formula is very simple to uh, compared to the formula we did before. Okay. So TMR for particular depth and particular field size at a depth D. So here's the field size at a depth D is equal to the PDD at a depth D for the field size at D max. That's not right. This should be at the surface. This is a, this formula is in Khan somewhere. Okay, let's just take a step. Let's just take a, a pause right here. Let's just double check this because I want to make sure. Let's turn on the lights. Let me see. <coughs> you see that? Yeah. Yeah, the, the terms are just called. Let me see. This, this. <coughs> so what's little f? Little f is your SSP. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and then what's r? r is the field size.
What does it say R is? Uh, R is a field side and Gibson's F. Oh, okay. So that's the SSD. Yeah. Okay. okay. So yeah, that's what I thought. This is <coughs> this is the field size at um, this is the field size at surface. So A at SSD. <coughs> <coughs> Whatever the SSD feel size is. Yeah. Okay. So that's how you convert from PDD to TMR. And this is feel size, and this should be an SSD. Okay. And usually, a scanning computer, after you've done the PDD scans, it'll convert your TMRs for you. You actually just click a button and it's done. Okay, let's do some examples, calculation examples. All right, so big A is an example of, uh, let's see, so big A, don't look at this right now. Big A equals little a equals 10 by 10. So big A equals little a equals 10 by 10 means what? There's no MLC. Okay, it's defined by the jobs. And the, <coughs> the depth is D max. So what's the MU? What am I writing here? We got a whole bunch to do, so let's. I want you guys to to participate in this. So what am I writing? Uh, your dose on top. Okay, what is it? Credit centigrade. Okay. Denominator? Okay, 10 by 10. So 10 by 10 uh, D max? <coughs> okay, so what are these? That's one. What's this? So remember what SFCP is. It's the measurement for a certain field size divided by the measurement uh, for a 10 by 10. Oh, so if your field size is 10, it's your measurement for a 10 by 10 divided by your measurement for a 10 by 10. Okay. So that's 1. Okay, it's so 1.0. What about TMR? We said that all the TPRs and TMRs are 1.0 at Dmax. Okay, so that's 1. So when you use R? 100. 100. Okay, next. <coughs> Okay, next problem. Big A equals little a equals 9.5 by 16, depth is 10. Okay, so mu equals 16. Okay, now, whenever you do a problem like this, any problem, any MU calculation problem, 
don't start <coughs> the way I just started. I just started because it's a really simple one. But you'll have a lot more complicated ones. Always start with things like you're going to need a field size, right? So yeah. calculate your field size. So start with that. Field size equals. Start with field size. Start with them. Sometimes you might have different, you might not be at 100, you might be at 110 or different. <coughs> so calculate your square factor, your field size, your depths. So what's your field size? 11.9 by 11. 11. I, I should say the field size is this, the equivalent square. The equivalent square. What? I got 11.92. So it's 2 times 9.5 times 16 over 9.5 plus 16. And what did you get? 11.92. Okay. All right, so then SF3, are we using SFCP or SFC and SFP? CP, A is equal to A. Because they're equal to each other, all right? And this is, we're going to say 11.92, what do you think? Does that make sense? Yeah. 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 TMR of what? Uh, same field size A and <coughs> depth field size C. Yeah. Right. Well, what is that? Can somebody look that up? You can use 12 for 11.92, but it won't make that much of a difference. SFCP? No, that was uh, the uh, 0.843. Uh, <coughs> and then we have 1.0 here. What about SFCP? Is there a table of SFCP? No, they're in the, in the slide. Can you break up? Well, we have an SFC and an SFP. Yeah, just multiplying. <coughs> For 12, we have six, it's 6 MB, isn't it? Is it 6? Is it 10? Yeah. Okay. So we have this times that. Can somebody do that? Okay. 1.014. Cute. And then the whole thing. Hundred and sixteen point nine nine. Sixteen point nine nine? Yeah. Okay. So that's equal to one second. Because <coughs> we can't put a decimal I'm using in the in the uh, the NAC, right? Okay, so that's one seventeen. Fine. Does that make sense, one seventeen by the way? Do we, we didn't do our sanity check. Uh, one seventeen. There's more of you here than there was here. This was a hundred of you. Why are there more? Uh, you're deeper. Okay, so you need more of you. That makes sense. Okay. And the, and the field size uh, uh, was a little bigger. So if the field size is bigger, do you need more news or less news? Less. Less. Okay, your field size is bigger, you get more scatter, so you need less news. <coughs> okay, two. Wow, this is getting messy. <laughs> two fields. Depth one is five cm. So here are the two fields. Here's the patient. We're going to treat the patient with lateral fields. The first depth is five cm. And the other depth is 15, so this is this one's 5, and this one's 15. Okay, A1 equals A2, so the field size of, of 1, this is this is 1 over here, and this is 2, <coughs> A2. Uh, field size of A1 and A2 are the same, and then, but, we've got a little A1 here, and a little A2. What does that mean? Right. MLC, right? Separate. Okay, so we have blocks. We have blocks now. Okay, so how do we do this one? Well, sorry. Okay. 
Should I do a slide? Sure. It's getting messy. <coughs> you okay? Yeah, I'm fighting the cold. Yeah. I don't know why the cough is acting up right now, but. <coughs> 10 by 18, 10, 18. 10 by 18. So what this means, A1 and A2, this is just the block equivalent square, like a 10 by 10, okay? And this is an 8 by 8 block equivalent square. Okay, so let's go. What, do we, what should we do first? Oh, what's the question? What's the question? Final like, MU to treat? How many MU? How many MU to treat? Is it 100 still? It's 100. Yeah. Okay. So let's go. <coughs> well, do we do a new first or do we calculate some other things? Well, we need the equivalent square. Now, are there going to be one of you or two of you's? Two of you's. Two of you's, right? Because there's two fields. So we have field. This is field one and this is field two. So, so it's this first thing. Okay, what do I do first? Let's do one first. <coughs> By the way, this is SAD. We're going to assume that the SO center is right here. Okay. All right, what do we need? Uh, one square. All right, so equivalent square, field one. So this is for field one. And when you guys answer these in your exam, I want you to, uh, to follow this pattern. You know, put the label in your field one so I know what, what you're doing, what you're calculating. So I'll put field one, equivalent square equals. <coughs> so write all that in. Okay, go ahead. What is it? Uh, 12 by 6, or one version, 2 times 10 times 18, or 10 plus 18. Huh? Which, which is 12.86. 12.86. Why don't we call this, um, what are the field sizes? Let's just call this. Well, we'll see what the nearest field size is. Okay, so that's equivalent square. Okay, what else do we need? Uh, SD and SD. Okay. We're still 10 on here, right? Yeah. Uh, what field size? Uh, <coughs> SD is for our 12.86. Well, let's do SP here, and then we'll look at both of them. Okay. SP of what? Uh, so that's our 10? Correct. Okay, so SP is phantom scatter. So phantom scatter depends on the actual aperture that lands on the patient. Okay, and that's 10. Even though our, our collimated jaws are bigger, but the patient doesn't see that larger collimated jaws because of because it's being blocked. Okay, so let's look those two up. Uh, for Should I back it up or do you have the table in front of you? I have the table in front of me. Okay. Uh, 1.011. What for, field size is that for? Uh, that is uh, 12 is 1.008 and 13 is 1.012. Okay, it's really good. 1.001. 1. So let's say 1.009. Okay. And that's a P for like 12.25, not 12.8. Oh, okay. <coughs> so 12.01? Uh, 1 or 1.1. One, one. Okay. Let's just keep it simple. 1.01. .01. Okay, what about 10? Uh, and there's 1. 1, correct. We don't even have to look that up. <coughs> okay, so we have those. What else do we need? Okay, TMR for what field size? Uh, the, the 10. The 10. TMR depends on phantom scatter. Okay, and that's 10. What about depth? Five. 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 Okay. So can somebody look that up? Uh, it's 0 0.966. 0 0.966. <coughs> okay. 
Okay. Can, are we ready to do our muse? All right, what am I writing? Are those? Is this? Uh, <coughs> is it 100? No, it's 50. 50. Yeah, I'll do this. I didn't tell you this, but we're going to assume equal weight. Okay, so okay. 50. Should we assume stuff like that on exams? or would you Yeah, tell if us? I don't tell you, just assume the simplest. Yeah, okay. okay. Like, I didn't give you guys the thickness of the block, server block. You know, I, you know, I guess I had to calculate the transmission of the server yeah. block. I didn't give you the thickness. And partly because I want you guys to remember what the thickness, typical thickness is. It's seven and a half CF. Oh, and you guys just assumed something and just said, yeah, for server. Okay. Yeah, for server blocks are pretty much across the board seven and a half CF. But I just, I wanted to see if you guys remember that. But it's okay if you put in a, just an arbitrary number, that was fine too. Okay. 10 equals 50. Divided by? What is that? 51.25. Wow. Very close to 50. Okay, very close to 50. So it's really close to uh, reference conditions. Uh, why is that? So, okay, it's not too deep. It's only 5 cm. And also, the field size was a little bit bigger than 10, so that reduces the end use as well. Okay, 0.966. Okay, so that's field one. Field two. <coughs> Same what? Equivalent square. Same equivalent square. So it's just the same as C. Okay. So C equals 1.01. Oh, 1. Oh, 1. I can't tell you what you can Okay, S of C is 1.01. All right, that's the same because the collimator setting is the same. What about SP? We need SP of A. Which is 0.92. CMR? A by A is depth 15. Field size? A by A. Uh -huh. Depth 15. Or 0 0.713? 0.713. Okay. Uh, uh, I don't know what happened to my time. Okay. Can that have you? 50 over all of that. <laughs> okay, what is that? Seven zero, right? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Seventy mu. Cool. Okay, those are real basic calculations. Let's keep going. All right. Now, SSD setup. We're getting away from SAD setup. We're going to do an SSD setup, and uh, we're not going to use PDD. We're going to use TMR. And there's the there's the problem. Let me change this color. Oh, 
I mean, whoops, that's a lot of you. <coughs> 14 by 10. So field center, it's a collimator setting is uh, 14 by 10. So that means that at the ISO center, you know, when I, if I say SAD, SSD, SSD is 110, 120, whatever, if I tell you the collimator setting is 14 by 18, 14 by 10 in this case, that's the field size at 100, no yeah. matter what the setup is. Okay? So you know that that's at 100. So that's not going to change. The collimator setting does not change depending on SAD, SSD. So 14 by 10 at 100, A is 8, and SSD is 100. So SSD is 100. Uh, the collimator setting, which is the field size at the surface, is 14 by 10. And A is 8, so there's a block there. Field size is a little smaller. The actual field size is a little smaller. And depth is 6. Wow, how do we do this? <clears throat> okay, so this one is a this is a little different. Uh, first, first we're going to use TMR. So since we're going to use TMR, um, we have to figure out what the field size is at our point of interest. We can't use this field size. TMR always needs to know what the field size is at the point of interest. So the easiest way of doing that is first figure out equivalent square of this, which is what? 11.67. What is it? 11.7. Okay, let's just say it's 12. So 11.7, approximately 12 cm. Okay. Now we know it's 12 cm equivalent square on the surface. We can use our similar triangles to figure out what the what the equivalent square is at 6 cm. Okay. So how do we do that? So 12 cm up here. So 12 divided by 100, 12 divided by 100 equals, since they're similar triangles, x divided by what? 106. Yeah, 106. So can someone do the math? Uh, 12.72. Okay. okay, so 12. I haven't changed much, but this is the right way to do it. Okay, so 12.72, we could say, do we have a... So we have data for 13. Anyway, let's just leave it. We 12. have data for 13. Okay. So 12.72 is our field size. Uh, all right. Now, not TMR. Hmm? I lied. We do not have not TMR. Not have TMR. Okay. Okay. So, um, if this were an SAD setup, would the MUs be higher or lower for the same dose? Before we, even, before we go on to calculate this, we expect M used to be higher or lower for the same dose? Lower. If this were an SAD, lower, right? Because we're closer to the source. Okay. So what's the difference between this and an, an SAD setup? It's just the distance of the source. Okay. So let's, So what we have to do is we need to know what the inverse square factor is. Okay. So the inverse square factor is... Now, factors are always, in, in a new calculation, factors are always in the denominator. Okay, so that's going to tell you something about whether it's going to be greater or less than y. Okay, so if we're further away, our inverse square factor should be smaller than 1 because we want to increase our mu's to be able to give the same dose at a further distance. So if it's smaller than 1 and it's in the denominator, our mu's are going to go up. Right? Right. Okay, so I just have, that kind of gives you a clue on what numbers to put in. We, we know that it's going to be 100 and 106, but we just don't know uh, what to put on top and what to put on the bottom. So it's going to be smaller than 1, so we're going to do 100 on top, 106 on the bottom. We're going to square that, and where we at? 0.889999. How about 0.89? Okay. Okay, so we have an inverse square factor. We have a depth. We have a equivalent, we have a equivalent square. Uh, oh wait, what about this? Yeah, so just find our SD and that's so the x doesn't make any sense. I think. Hmm? So that twelve point seven two doesn't make any sense. I think. It doesn't make sense because it is for the the upper case a. It's it's for upper case a, right? Yeah. So it's for the s c right s sub c right. But we need our s sub p which is related to the lowercase a. Right. 
So S of C does not oh, depend. We didn't have to do that. Jimmy's right. S of C depends on collimator setting at yeah. 100. Okay, so you won't have to change field sizes for S of C. If I give you a collimator setting of 14 by 10, you need to calculate S of C. Um, you can use 14 by 10 because that's how you always calculate S of C at 100 because that's where S of C is measured. S of C is 12. This is still 10 and B, right? 10 and B, yeah. Okay, but what about we need a new little light though, don't we? Yeah. Okay. So this is uh, this is little a. So what's our new little a? So we're going to call this block equivalent square. Every time you pick up the eraser, you set it down and reset the eraser to the ball. Block equivalent square equals it's eight times our ratio that we had over here. All right? So it's what is it? Eight point four. Eight point five, okay. Okay, so I knew. What am I doing? 100? Uh, I didn't specify any ones. So okay, let's just say 100. What am I writing? I hear somebody mumbling back there. SC, which is 1.008. Okay. Wait, is it? Where am I? It's the SC for. Okay, so we're going to get rid of this because we don't need this. And we're just going to write S of C of 12. Oh, oh, okay. SC of. You mean S of P? SP of 8.5 is 0 0.994. 0 0.994. <coughs> Okay, 0 0.89. And let's, um, what field size are we going to use for TMR? 8.5. 8.5 in depth? 6. 6. Okay, so Zero point nine three seven. Okay, so what do we get? One hundred and twenty. One hundred and twenty and you. All right. Now, if you guys want to want to check this when you go uh, when you go back home, just double check and do it with PDD. Okay. Okay. So check it out. See if it works out with PDD. So that's how that's how we do it, and that's how in the clinic most clinics have TMR tables and they don't have PDD tables. And again, what's the problem with PDD tables? You need a PDD table for every SSD you use, right? Well, you don't need a different TMR table for every SSD you use. So if you're going to treat a patient at 105 SSD, you can use this. If you're going to treat them at 110 SSD, you can use this. You're just going to change your inverse square factor. To, to reflect it. That's why this is so versatile. Okay, so even in SSD setups, I use this. I use TMR tables. Uh, oh, there. Okay. There's a solution there. The Collimator coupled square is one seven is eleven point seven at a hundred. Okay. There's a lot of jumbled stuff at the top. I know. I think it all got it, crammed in there. It's all there. Uh, it's all there. Then. Use the inverse square to get 12.4 centimeters in depth. Mm -hmm. The block equivalent square. <coughs> and then you find TMR. SC is based on 11.7 SP and use the inverse square. Mm -hmm. Okay.
aren't those calculations hard? So now, so we've calculated the MUs to a point. But what if we want to calculate the dose after we've been given MU? Say they give you MUs, 200 MUs, and say calculate the dose at a point inside the patient. It's kind of going the opposite. And it might be a, you might want to do this if you want to know what the dose to the rectum is. If you're irradiating the prostate, you want to know the dose to the rectum, which is a different point. You want to know the dose to the bladder or any other interest point inside the body of the patient. You would do this thing here after you know the MUs. So you've delivered 200 centigrade with uh, 10 by 10 ABPA fields, 10 MV photons, the midpoint in a 30 centimeter separation patient with equal weight. What is the dose delivered to DMAX on patient's anterior surface? Uh, no. Okay. So, all right, so let's think about this. Deliver 200 centigrade with APPA. So we have two fields and 200 centigrade. So AP field is 100 centigrade, PA field is 100 centigrade. Um, 30 centimeter separation, it's mid plane. So what's the depth? 15. 15 to 15. Okay, that makes it easy. Equal weight. What is the dose delivered to Dmax? Well, let's try it. Maybe I'll do another slide here. Round patient. AP field. Isocenter. PA field. <coughs> okay, we know this is 200. We know this is 15 cm. Great. But what's Say the patient's got some kind of reaction going on, and you want to know the doctor says, "What's I want to know what the dose of Dmax is." This is how you do it. So we want to know what the dose of Dmax is at the anterior surface. Did we get any field sizes yet? Ten by ten. Okay. Oops. Almost want to go there. What happened to my slide? Ah, okay. So the ten by ten. All right. What do we do? Well. Where's the dose coming from? The dose that we get here. Obviously, it's coming from the AP. Is there any dose coming from the PA? Yeah, there's a dose coming from the, there's exit dose. So we need to calculate the dose from the AP and the dose from the PA. Okay. So let's do dose from AP first. So we want to separate this problem. Um, I wonder if I can. I think I can move this whole thing. I'm gonna move this over. Uh, where's the move? Try using the mouse cursor. This thing? No. The arrow at the top. Okay. You should be able to select it as a drawing. Just this one? Oh. I've not done this. Really click on it. Oh. I have done it before. Uh, that's un that's, I think that's undo. Eraser. Yeah. So if, uh, maybe try the mouse for right clicking. Or yeah. Try what? Try the mouse for like right clicking. This one here. Yeah. yeah. See what happens. I won't want you to pick it as a drawing. I've done it before though. There's, isn't there, I thought there was a hand. I can't see it. Oh, I see. Obviously, I'm going shape kind of shape work on the screen here. I am. Freehand capture. I'll just erase it, you guys. I'll just redraw it really quickly. I here on the side. This eraser slow. I guess I gotta clear the drawing too. Okay. So AP patient 15 cm uh, 10 by 10 people. Okay. We want to know what the dose of the max is. So we know it's 100 monomers, right? Is that right? Or was it 100 or 200? Oh, we were given setting rates. Oh. oh, okay. So we need to calculate MUs first. Mm, I don't know. 
We have centigrades. We can calculate it as a ratio. You can ratio it out. Okay. Uh, you could do you could do it that way too. You can calculate the monitor units and then figure out what the dose to be max is, or you could ratio it out. So I'll show you one way. You guys can do the other way. Uh, so first thing is, um, so we know TMR equals dose at depth divided by dose at Dmax. Okay. So we have we have dose at depth is 100. Okay. We want to calculate dose at Dmax. So do we have TMR? Oh, what's the field size? Let's write, all, write, let's write down all the knowns. Field size is 10 by 10 at the point of interest. But what's the field size at Dmax? Uh, so what's the energy? Hmm? Well, well, so 10. 10. 10. So, maybe the So it's 10 times, what's the ratio? Using similar triangles, the ratio of distances. Um, well, first of all, Dmax is 2.5. Yeah. Yeah. So it's 10 times. What's the SSD? Uh, the SSD is 8 85. SSD is 85. Okay. SSD is 85. Yeah, plus 2.5. 85 plus 2.5. 87. So yeah, so 87 is right here, 87. Okay, so that's the distance to, to our point of interest. All right, so that's, then the, the field size is 10 by, all right, so it's 8.75 or about 9. Let's just call it 9. Okay, so that's a field size at Dmax. Right. Uh, so, so we can, what we can do is we can take the, uh, the dose, because we're starting with a dose of 100 times uh, the TMR. So what about a CCP? Well, our SC, the field size, is 10. So. We're going to need S of P of 10. Uh, S of P of 10 is 1. Okay. So here's what we need to do. We need to, we need to so our starting point is 100. So we need to take 100 times the ratio of TMRs times the ratio of S of, S of, uh, S. S of P's. S. Why don't we care about the ratio of S of C's? Same so thing. Correct. We don't need to change our column here. So we only concern about the ratio of S of P. So what we're going to take 100 times our ratio of TMRs. So TMR, first, is the dose going to go up or down? If we go from here to here, up. It goes up. Okay, here's, so this is the usual thing. If the dose has to go up, we need to put a big number in the numerator and a small number in the denominator. Okay, so the ratio of TMRs. Um, oh, let's get those two TMRs also. So one TMR is the TMR for down here, and the other TMR is the one for up here. So the TMR down at deeper depth, that's a field size of 10, and the depth of 15. Can somebody give me that? Uh, 10 by 10, depth of 15 is 0 0.723. 0 0.723. The other TMR is that one up there. Of TMRs, we know that the dose is going to go up, so we need to do 1.0 over 0 0.723 okay. times ratio of S of P's. Now, this this is actually a very small correction factor. Okay. So if you're in the clinic and you're in a rush, that might not be a big deal. But you leave that out. But the proper way of doing this is to, is to throw in the ratio of S of P's. If you're going from here to here, the field size is getting smaller, isn't it? 
So do you expect the scatter to go, the dose contribution from scatter to go up or down if you want? Down, because there's a small field size, less contribution than scatter, so the dose is lower. So that it's the opposite effect of this. So now, if you expect the dose to go lower, then we need to do S of P of 9 divided by S of P of 10. Because we know that the scatter is going to go down, and this is going to ensure that it reduces our, our dose. Okay? Is that it? We have one more thing to do. One more thing that affects our dose. We're moving closer to the source. Is it 100 over 87.5? You're moving closer to the source. We're going to multiply by the dose, so we want it to go higher. What is that equal to? Uh, 0.336. That's a big number. That's a big factor. That's 30%. Okay. So make sure that one's right. Okay. What's that all equal to? 180. 180. All right. So that gives you guys an idea. Uh, what happens at Dmax from an AP field with the difference in doses between a 15 centimeter depth and Dmax? Okay, it's 80 percent higher. Okay, now for the other one, now that's so that's AP. PA is a little more complicated because in, in PA, I'll let you guys do this at home because we're running out of time. In PA, this TMR up here is not one. Because you're gonna you're going from a depth of 15 to a depth of all right, okay, and that's different. And also, you know, your inverse square factor you're going you're going from um, from here to here. It's lower, so your dose is going to drop. So your do dose is going to drop for, for two reasons: you're further from the source, and you're also a lot deeper. Okay, so the so the dose contribution from the PA field to Dmax is pretty low. Which is expected, right? It's exit dose. It's gone through all that attenuation. So I'll let you guys work on that at home. Actually, that, that, they love asking that question in board exams. Questions like this. Like, you calculate the point dose at, at a different point inside the patient. Okay, so how do we estimate block changing gears here? How do we estimate block, block equivalent square? Uh, and remember how the little a, I just give you a number. Well, you folks are going to have to know how to calculate that little number okay, from the blocks. And so this is how you do it. These are just some examples of beams I've used. This is a, the red lines represent the collimated equivalent square. And these are just some blocks that I just made up. Okay? Estimating block equivalent square for width of 10 and length of 8. Okay, so uh, width of 10, so x is 10, and this is y is 8. So how would you do that? So first you have to estimate. The, now, this is not very scientific. This is an, uh, there's some estimation going on. <coughs> but as it turns out, the estimate, uh, it doesn't make much of a difference if you're off a little bit. Estimate the percent of area not covered by the block. So that's this area, or this area, not covered by the block. Multiply that percentage by the open field equivalent square. And then take the square root to get the side of the equivalent square of the block field. Square. Uh, actually, I changed, I shouldn't say, but the open field width times the length. Okay, I changed that. All right, so let's do one. Let's look at this one. What's the percent of area not covered by the block? 50. 50. Multiply by the open field width and length. Okay, so in this case, we have 0.5, 50%, times 10 times 8, 40, right? Square root of 60, uh, 3, 2. So square root of 40 equals what? 
6.32. So that's the equivalent square for the block. Okay. And also, you know, do your sanity check. 6.32 needs to be between 10 and 8. Uh, 6.32 has to be uh, smaller than the equivalent square of 10 by 8. What's the equivalent square of 10 by 8? Uh, 10, 2 times 10 times 8 over 18. 8.88. So, uh, so 6.32 has to be smaller than that. It's just a sanity check for you guys. What about this one? I'll give you a, I'll give you a trick. And this is a trick that works for me. Maybe it doesn't work for everybody. You know, you can use it if you want, if you don't. I divide the field into quadrant, four quadrants. And I say every each of these quadrants is 25%. Okay, and then I just have to work within one quadrant. Okay, then I just have to work within my little 25%. And so I look at this block and I look at I know this is 25%. Well, 12 and a half percent would be this. Right? So that's less than 12 and a half. I could say 12%. Okay, call this call this that it's I'm being I'm blocking 12 percent. So 25 minus 12 is 13. So then I can do 13 plus 25 plus 25 plus 25. So 13 plus 75 is 88. Okay, so the open percentage is 88 percent. That's how I like to do it. All right, so in this case, 88 percent, you would say 0 0.88 times. 10 times 8 all square root. So it's around 8.4. Okay, so 8.4. What was this one? 6.32. That makes sense. This is this is a bigger field. Okay, and you could do the same with the other ones. Divide it into quadrants. Look at this one. I mean, that could be 12.5 right there. This is a little bit more than 12.5. And think of Right now, I'm talking about blocking, but we're really looking at the open area. So how much open area? This looks like it's maybe 8% open area there. 8% here, I don't know, maybe 10 here. 12.5 is this. So 10% and 8 is 18 plus 50, 68% of open field. Okay. So that's how you estimate block to public square. And we need this to calculate our little a for our TMRs and our SPs. Okay. Uh, Off-axis ratio OAR. So OAR is um, we need OAR because to calculate monitoring units, we actually use OAR because we know that the profiles at different depths look different. Remember how this the profile at Dmax looks like this with the horns. This is central axis right here. It's got horns on the sides of Dmax, and then this is a depth of 10 cm. We call that a flat field. And then as you get deeper, the shoulders start to drop. And we have, we have, we talked about why that all that is. Okay. So because that those at an off axis distance is not the same as central axis, if we need to calculate a point off axis, we need to know that. We need to know whether the dose is higher or lower. Okay. So now this is another factor that we need we need to know. And there are tables of OARs that help us. So OAR depends on depth, obviously, because the profiles. And it also depends on the radius from central axis at, a, at that certain depth. So dose at a distance RD from central axis from a depth D divided by the dose at central axis at the same depth must be used to calculate and use when prescription point is not on central axis. Okay, so that's the equation. So it's a dose at an off-axis depth divided by the dose at the central axis. And you know, all the average, it's about a 2%, 3% correction. It's not a big deal. Well, 2%, 3% could be a big deal, depending on what you do. And then how do you measure? OAR is measured in a water tank with a scanning chamber. Each depth is measured separately, and the readings are all divided by the reading at the center of the beam. Okay. And then this, there's a question here. OAR, so tank, tank looks like this. Here's the water surface. So we just scan a chamber across. Now, OARs are um, they're done at SAD. So the scan has to be done at SAD. So if we change the depth, we need to change the water surface. Do this. Okay. OAR has an inherent inverse square factor built into it. Why? Well, let's see what that means. Here's the beam. Here's the water tank. Here's central axis. 
Okay, and here's our point of interest. So OAR is defined as the dose at this point divided by the dose at D max. If you notice at this point, it's further away from the beam than this point is. Okay, so that, that fact, so you guys, when you're doing these problems, you might say, oh, I have an off axis point here. Oh, it's further away, I have to apply an inverse square factor. You don't. It's already built into the OAR because of the way that we measure it. Okay? Because we measure OAR by taking this measurement divided by this measurement. So the inverse square is already there. Okay? You understand why it's because it's further, right? Because it's the hypotenuse of the triangle. The hypotenuse is longer than that. Okay? Then scatter maximum ratio, this is the this is the um, an, an analogous factor to the SAR. But now we're using TMR tables. And this is actually more commonly used in the SAR because people don't use TARs as much. So this is very similar to what we looked at with TAR. The TMR, and can someone tell me why why would you want to use this? When you would use it, what's the application of the SMR? I did a little example at the end of the last lecture. For regular fields, on regular fields, the central axis is here. And we want to know what the, what the dose to a point of the central axis is. Since it's not a square field, we can't just use TMR and SFP and SFC because of this blocked field. We could use that blocked equivalent square estimation that I just discussed. We could use that. But a much more uh, accurate way is to measure the radii at known, known delta delta thetas, known delta theta, and known delta thetas all the way around, measure the radii, and for each radii, calculate the SMR for each radius. Calculate the SMR, and then sum it up, get an average, and put it in this equation, and multiply by the zero field TMR. And now this here, is not as simple to calculate as the TAR. Remember, the TAR was a mu, uh, was just a, a function of mu. This one you can just extrapolate from the tables. Let's extrapolate to zero field size. Okay, and then there's also this factor right here, the ratio of SMPs for a zero field size. Again, you extrapolate to get this, and this you can look it up, up in a table. Okay, so SMR is used to accurately calculate the scatter in a regular field. And then this is just an example of a block field with some radii on it. And then here's some SMCs and SMPs. And I'm going to use that block block. I'm talking about those right. So let's see if we're going to those right. Okay, so this one here, it's another. Did it, did it say 28 slides? You added oh, two. Oh, I added like two. two? Did I add two or three? Two. Okay, so this, this is the last one. Yep. So this is an example. Of an asymmetric field now, we haven't talked about asymmetric fields. Okay, so an asymmetric field x1, x2, y1, y2, calculate the dose rate at a depth of 5 cf. Okay, and the dose rate is the denominator of that in your equation. And the dose rate is the 1 centigrade per mu times SCP times S of C times TMR times the square factor if there's one in there. So that's what you need to do. Now add a block that blocks 20% of the field and calculate the dose rate. And now assume the patient has moved 10 cm further away from the source and calculate the dose rate. So this first part here, we've already done this. The only difference is that it's it's an asymmetric field. Okay, so the field would look something like this. X1 is 5. And X1 is on the left. Uh, X2 is 10. Here's the central axis. So X2 is 10. Okay, Y1 is 5. Uh, oops, sorry, that's why two. Why two is ten. This is not to scale. Why one is five. Okay, so we have an asymmetric field. How would you calculate the monitor units? I mean, it's the same way. You can use the equivalent square. In your equivalent square, you would take as a to be fifteen, then b is fifteen. I mean, the fact that it's a, the fact that it's asymmetric doesn't affect it that much. 
Okay, the scatter is the same. It's similar, but it's not exactly the same. And then, uh, then you add a block that blocks 20% of the field. So you can just make up a block that blocks 20% of the field. And then in that, in that case, then you've got a little A you have to work with. Okay, calculate the dose rate. Now, so the patient has moved 10 cm further from a source. And once you do that, a couple of things happen. The field size gets bigger, and you're further from the source, so there's an inverse the square factor. Okay? So we're not going to go through I'm going to let you guys do it. And that's it. Any questions? The best thing with these is to do as many examples as possible. I've given you guys an assignment. Um, my, what I could do is I could photocopy some more Rayfex problems and send them to you. Would that be helpful? Yeah. Because yeah. there's a lot of problems in Rayfex. Yeah. yeah. That's good. They're just basic problems. They're not too tricky. Uh, is there a test effect for, for our test? Is there a what? A test effect? Test effect, yeah. No. Not that I know of. I know that there's a Yahoo group for ABR, for people who are studying for their ABR exams. This is Yahoo, so Google that, or Yahoo it. Maybe Yahoo, the Yahoo group uh, for a test bank. And I know they post a lot of questions on there, and they have the answers too, but the answers are not always right. The answers are just, you know, whatever this person came up with. So, but at least you have an idea of the questions that, yeah. that you get on the board. Have you guys heard of that Yahoo group? The ABR Yahoo group? It's not a bad one to get on, even at this point. 